It being 2 p.m., I'll call the. Uh, I'll call the Leader of the Government, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Order. Ms. Order. Mr President, I seek leave to make a statement regarding ministry changes and a ministerial absence. I thank Order. the Senate. Order. I thank the Senate. Order. I advise that Senator Canavan will be absent from question time today due to overseas ministerial business. In Senator Canavan's absence, Senator Scullion will represent the Minister for Resources in Northern Australia, and Senator Scullion will represent the Minister for Agriculture and Water Resources. I advise senators that, in, in addition to my portfolio and representational responsibilities, I will be answering questions in relation to Prime Minister, Treasurer, Finance, Revenue and Financial Services, and Special Minister of State. Order. In addition to, in addition to her existing responsibilities. Senator Payne will answer questions in relation to the portfolios of women, home affairs, immigration and border protection, social services, attorney general, citizenship and multicultural affairs, law enforcement and cyber security, international development and the Pacific and human services. In addition to their existing portfolio responsibilities, Order. Senator Scullion will answer questions in relation to jobs and innovation and small and family business, the workplace and deregulation, and that Senator McKenzie will take questions in relation to communications and the arts, and I table a letter regarding government leadership arrangements. Senator, Sen order. Senator Wong. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave granted. Uh, it may have been dealt with by the letter that has just been tabled by Senator Birmingham, but I ask a very simple question. Who leads the government in this chamber? Well, that's a bit up. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I have tabled a letter that, uh, that deals with that. I can inform the Senate uh, that I have been appointed the Leader of the Government in the Senate, uh, that Senator Payne has been appointed the Deputy Leader of the Government in the Senate, and that Senator Rustin has been appointed the Manager of Government Business in the Senate. Order. Questions without notice. Order. Senator Chisholm. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, whoever that may be. <laughs> Who is the Prime Minister of Australia? Yes. Senator Birmingham. Malcolm Turnbull. Senator Chisholm. Check. When will the Liberal Party tell the Australian Order. people who, will be, who, who they will be asked to support as Prime Minister at the next election? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr President, uh, Mr Turnbull has given a statement today in which he has indicated a process that uh, may lead to a party room meeting to be held at 12 o'clock tomorrow. Uh, to consider the leadership of the Liberal Party. Uh, if that meeting occurs, it will determine the leadership of the Liberal Party, uh, and that, of course, will uh, ensure that appropriate arrangements are then informed to the Governor General. Senator Chisholm, a final supplementary He's question. He's taking his baton, boy. After five years of dysfunction after, and after adjourning the House of Rep Representatives to avoid public scrutiny of this broken government, when will the Prime Minister, whoever that may be, let the Australian people cast their judgment by going to an election? Yeah. Yeah. Order. Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr President, as you know, an election is due, and as all senators know, an election is due Order. in the middle of next year. That is the normal course of events. It will be up to the Prime Minister to determine when an election is held in accordance with the Westminster system. The election, of course, will be an election that I trust will Order. still be fought on the track record of a coalition government that has, that has delivered record jobs growth that is bringing the budget back to balance, that is delivering and has legislated tax cuts for Australians, tax cuts that the Labor Party intends to roll back. The Labor Party intends to roll back tax cuts for hard-working Australians, to roll back tax cuts for Australian small businesses. Ultimately, when it comes to the Australian people voting, they need to vote on the issues of the day and on the future of the country and the future of the country will be in worse hands on those opposite who will see Australian households and businesses paying higher taxes. Order. Senator Hume. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Education and Training, Senator Birmingham, representing the Treasurer. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the release, the, on the release of recent economic data on the Australian economy, how it demonstrates that the government's economic plan is working to drive to drive Order. economic growth, to drive, to drive economic growth and create Order. jobs. Order on my left. 
Order on my left, I have repeatedly asked for silence during questions so that I may hear them, let alone other senators in the chamber. The Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, the coalition government's plan for a stronger economy is working and is delivering. We have, as I was just telling the Senate, delivered tax relief, Order. Tax relief that will help and encourage hard-working Australians. Tax relief that will see that will see more Australians get to keep more of their money. More of their money. The unemployment rate fell to 5.3 per cent in July the lowest rate since November 2012. 15,300 people, uh, there are fewer unemployed since the last election. There are 600,000 more jobs across the Australian economy. 339,000 plus jobs were created in 2017-2018, the strongest financial year result in more than a decade in terms of jobs growth. We have turned the corner on wages, seeing wages growth increase by 0.6 per cent in the June quarter, the largest quarterly increase in four years. Average weekly ordinary time earnings for full-time adults increased by 2.7 per cent over the year to May, the strongest annual growth seen since 2014. Retail sales are up, business conditions are at elevated levels. Ultimately, we see across the board that Australians, in terms of jobs growth, Wages growth, Absolutely business growth, good. investment opportunities are all enjoying the benefits of a stronger economy. And that is what matters most, Mr. President. What matters most is the reality that the Australian people are better off as a result of a government that has delivered Order. for them in terms of that stronger economy, in terms of that wages growth, in terms of that employment growth. And of course, they will be better off in the future because of the tax cuts that this parliament has legislated under the leadership of the coalition government. They will be better off because there will still be further jobs growth under the competitive tax rates we've legislated, all of which will deliver Order. more for more Australians. Senator Hume, supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Will the minister explain to the Senate how the government has acted to ensure Australians keep more of the money that they earn? so that they can create more opportunities for themselves. Order. Order on my left. Senator, Senator Carr. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, because of the coalition government's tax cuts, Australians are going to keep more of their money, and they will get to keep even more of their money as long as there continues to be a coalition government in the future. But if those opposite are elected, Australians will be paying higher taxes. Order. Mr. President, Senator I... Birmingham, please resume your seat. Order on my left. Order on my left. If I call order, take a breath and count to three before the interjections continue. Senator O'Sullivan. Mr. President, now that I'm on the front bench, I'm, more, I'm even more, I'm more keenly interested to hear what the senator has to say, and I can hardly hear it for the noises from the other side. Order on my left. And Senator O'Sullivan is a lot closer to this end of the chamber now and should be able to hear. So I will ask for silence. Senator, or, Senator Carr, Senator Collins on a point of order? Yes, on a point of order. I ask uh, what portfolio has been allocated to Senator O'Sullivan. <laughs> the minister made a statement earlier with respect to responsibilities. Senator Birmingham. Uh, Mr. President, in relation to the tax cuts delivered order. for Australians, I want to pay tribute to the work of Mr Turnbull and the work of Mr Morrison, but importantly to the work of Senator Cormann as well in the delivery of those tax cuts for hard-working Australians. To the work of Senator Cormann, just indeed Senator his colleagues, Senator Fifield in relation to media reform, Senator Cash in relation to the Regional Organisations Commission re establishment and bringing back the ABCC, all of whom have delivered significant reforms that are important for the Australian economy for ensuring that Australians keep more of their hard-earned dollars, for ensuring that Australians in the future will have a stronger economy with more jobs growth building Order, off of Senator what is already Birmingham. record Senator jobs. Senator Hume, a final supplementary question. Yes, thank you, Mr President. Will the minister inform the Senate on how the government is supporting small businesses through tax relief so that they can continue to grow and create more jobs? Senator Cameron, I, I repeat my request that I hear questions. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, 2.2 million small businesses contribute some $378 billion to the Australian economy annually, and they employ 
4.7 million people, or around 44 per cent of the Australian workforce. And as this Senate well knows, we successfully legislated to deliver tax cuts for those businesses as well as extending the internet debt write-off. But this Senate also well knows that those opposite have a policy to increase the rate of tax in the future relative to what this parliament has already legislated. And in the next election campaign next year, those opposite will have to line up and explain to many, to hundreds of thousands of Australian households, to thousands of Australian small businesses that they intend to make them pay more taxes. They intend for those businesses, those households to pay higher levels of tax in the future. We know the Labor Party's company tax policy, and that is to put the rate back up for small businesses in Australia, and Order, that will hurt Senator jobs Birmingham. growth in the future. Order. Senator McCarthy. Mr President, my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, whoever that may be. How many ministers currently serve in the Liberal National Government? Who are they and what are their portfolios? Order. The minister outlined earlier representational arrangements. We've had a couple of quips. They're not necessary on an ongoing basis. Senator Wong. Well, uh, on, on that ruling, Mr President, the minister outlined representing arrangements and who would take questions for question time. The substance of Senator McCarthy's question is quite different. I was referring to the quip at the beginning of the question that said whoever that may be. It is clear who is representing oh, well. the Prime Minister. You Order can Senator, see them, Senator, can't Senator, you, Senator, Senator Abetz? Abetz. And Senator Wong. It is clear who is representing the Prime Minister. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, well, indeed, I did outline representational arrangements. It is a matter of fact that there have been a number of resignations from the ministry. Uh, those resignations, of course, will be filled in the due course. Uh, and, of course, once, once ministerial arrangements have been completed and updated, uh, then the Senate will receive a tabled copy of ministerial arrangements, as is the normal course of events. Senator McCarthy, a supplementary question. Yes, Mr. President. How many ministers have resigned and who are they? Senator Birmingham. I refer the minister, the senator to my uh, previous answer. Order. Order. Senator McCarthy, a final supplementary question. Senator McCarthy is on her feet. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Mr. President. After five years of dysfunction, after adjourning the House of Representatives to avoid public scrutiny and without a Prime Minister or a functioning government, Senator when will the Prime Minister, whoever that may be, let the Australian people cast their judgment on this broken government by going to an election? Yeah. Senator Macdonald, I've asked for silence during questions. Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, Mr. President. We will have an election in the normal course of events, but it will be an election, as I've told this Senate chamber already, it will be an election that will be a stark, stark contrast. A stark contrast between a government that has the track record of growing jobs, of bringing the budget back to balance, of ensuring, of ensuring that we have tax relief legislated for Australian households, of ensuring that we have legislated tax relief for small Australian businesses and a contrast with the Labor Party. And you ought to all be honest enough to go out there and tell the thousands of Australian businesses whose tax rates you're going to put up relative to what this parliament has legislated. You ought to be honest enough to go out there and tell the Australian households that who you're going to make pay higher levels, higher levels of income tax. The Australian, the Australian retirees who are going to pay higher levels of tax under your tax policy. $200 billion plus of Order. higher Senator taxes Birmingham. under Time the Labor the Party has that Australians— Senator Di Natale. Thanks very much, Mr President. Uh, my question is to the Leader of the Government representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Uh, Minister, isn't it time to be honest with the Australian people? The key reason you're all knifing the Prime Minister is for daring to even propose just the illusion of reducing climate pollution and modernising the energy system. Is even pretending to stop dangerous climate change too much for your incompetent, divided and self-absorbed government? Order. Order. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. There are two problems with the. Well, actually, there are many problems with the Australian Greens, but there are two that I'll particularly single out on uh, on this occasion. One, of course, is that when it comes to climate change, to energy policy, no measure is ever extreme enough for the Australian Greens. 
No measure is ever extreme enough. But the other is that they always fail to actually look at the facts. And the facts are that Australia is on track to meet our 2020 target. Our projected emissions in 2020 have come down with every single update. Order. Our position on the 2030 target has also improved by over 120 million tonnes since the December 2016 projections were released. When the 2020 emissions target was announced in 2008, 1,335 million tonnes of emissions were needed. Now we are on track to overachieve that 2020 target. That's driven by a range of factors, including the rate of technological change. But what the Greens just deny and refuse to accept is the reality that Australia, because of technological change, because of innovation, has been able to continuously meet and exceed our projections targets. That's what happened. That's what happened in relation to the first Kyoto target. It's what is happening now in relation to the 2020 target. And I would expect it is exactly what will happen as well as the current trend lines are showing in relation to the 2030 target. Senator Thien, entirely a supplementary question. Minister, the 45th parliament will forever be defined by the complete capitulation to those who deny the existence of dangerous global warming. Minister, why has your government chosen to fight amongst yourselves rather than fighting to save the Great Barrier Reef, rather than fighting for a safe and stable climate, rather than fighting for our farmers, rather than fighting for future generations? Senator, Senator Birmingham. Mr President, the historians will decide how they define the 45th parliament, but indeed for Australian families, for hard-working Australian families, they will remember that the 45th parliament was the parliament that legislated the most comprehensive income tax reforms to eliminate issues of bracket creep. Australian small businesses will remember the 45th parliament as the parliament in which they were legislated with more competitive tax rates. Australian families will remember this parliament as a parliament where they received a fairer, better childcare system that provides around $1,300 per child additional support for them. Indeed, some people will remember the 45th parliament as the parliament in which same-sex marriage was legalised, Senator. Indeed, there are many things this parliament will be remembered for. There are many things that we ought to be proud of out of this parliament. There are many things that we will continue to work on as a government in relation to this parliament. We will continue Order. to work Senator to ensure— Senator Birmingham, time for the answer has expired. Senator Di Natale, a final Th supplementary question. Thanks, Mr President. The international community Order. is watching— the international community is watching Australia right now, investors, scientists, diplomats and so on. Minister, are you proud that your government has announced to the rest of the world that Australia is now the climate-denying capital of the world? Order. Senator Birmingham. If there is one thing that the coalition will never do, it is take lectures from the Australian Greens on the idea of what is good for investor certainty. I mean, what a preposterous idea that the Australian Greens, who of course, in terms of their policies, would see vastly higher energy prices in Australia, vastly less agricultural activity, vastly lower reliability in terms of energy. The Australian Greens are one of the biggest threats to investor certainty in Australia. But you know what's worse? The reason the Greens are a threat is because of their alliance with the Australian Labor Party. If the Labor Party didn't insist, as they did when they were last on in government, of doing deal after deal after deal with the Australian Greens, then the Greens would be irrelevant. But instead, the Australian Greens are the tail that wags the Australian Labor Party's dog. And that is the threat. That is why Labor is so committed to higher taxes, because they have to meet the Greens' promises in terms Order. of spending. Senator Birmingham. Before I come to you, Senator Stirl, we are joined in question time today by former Senator the Honourable Nick Sherry. Uh, who is visiting above the government, above the, in the gallery above the government benches? Welcome back to the Senate, Senator Sherry. Yeah. Senator Stirl. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator Scullion. Does the National Party maintain confidence in the Liberal National Coalition government? <laughs> the minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator Scullion. Yes, Order. yes, we do, and we do for a very good reason. Uh, through you, Mr. President, we do because it is the coalition government that will ensure that the Australian people—and that is what we're all for. 
doesn't matter what area of this program you're this this parliament you're for, you believe in making this a better place for Australians. Well, I can tell you uh, that any alternative to the national Liberal coalition will be bad for this country. Can you imagine raising taxes by more than two? billion dollars because that's what the alternative's going to do more than 2 billion dollars destroy house prices we all rely on the equity we have in the australian dream in our home that is looking like it's going down the tube they're going to raid the superannuation account of every single pensioner and to the ex senator i know you would shudder about that order well i talk about those sort of things that people are concerned about what about the reopening of our borders? What about the flow, the tsunami of misery that that will cause? Because the last time, the last time they promised, oh, that will never happen. We went straight away Order. to measure the number of boats arriving by the day. By the day, that was the unit measurement. How many boats are arriving today? We proudly stand and say, none this year. None the year before. None the year before that. It said, how many was it today? Order. Look, I think it's 14 or 28. As that tide of misery from such pathetic policies, driven by the fundamentalist ideology of the Greens, is something that the Australian people will never take over a sensible and concerned government like the National Liberal Coalition. Order. Order on my The left. introduction. Of a Time has expired, Senator Scullion. Order. Senator Stirl, a supplementary question. Yes, I do. Thank you, Mr. President. Given that the National Party maintains confidence in this broken Liberal national government, can the minister tell the Senate who the National Party is expressing confidence in? What is their name? Senator Scullion. Well, that, that is entirely a matter from the Liberal Party. Uh, but it's about confidence. You are right, Senator. Is it about confidence? And Order this is about the left. price of the Australian people. And I know that the Australian people are going to have uh, much more confidence in the coalition than they have in a shortened government. Senator Collins. Uh, the obvious introduction. Uh, again, we'll have the introduction of another tar carbon tax on the back of a 45 per cent emission target. I mean, who's going to be? Which pensioner is going to afford to reach out the finger to switch the light on? Who on a fixed income, on a settling benefit, on a fixed income, is going to dare to go and switch the heater on? Just rug up in winter. They all know. They know that it's far better to stay warm under a coalition government than they ever are from that rabble on that side. Can you remember? I can remember, Sturley. Uh, Senator Malandiri, uh, sorry, Senator Ma McCarthy. Order, is, Senator we can Scullion, remember being in North has, Australia. The answer has expired. Take your Senator Scullion. I don't want to start yelling. I will, if necessary, Senator Farrell. Senator Stirl, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Minister, after five years of dysfunction. After adjourning the House of Representatives to avoid public scrutiny and without a Prime Minister or a functioning government, will the National Party join Labor in calling for an election to allow the Australian people to elect a functioning government? Order. Order. Senator Collins. Senator Collins. Senator O'Neill. Senator Scullion. Uh, no, we will not. Senator Mr. Collins. No, we will not, Mr. President, and there's some great reasons for that. <laughs> the reason we would never support uh, those on the other side is that we would not accept the sort of utterances of five years of, dis of dysfunctional government. Australians know you talk about the million people who have got a job. The million people who have got a job. They, the Order. people who have had their income Senator tax Scullion, returns, please which resume is, your seat. Which... Senator Scullion. Senator Scullion. Senator Scullion. If I'm calling senators to order, I expect them to at least heed it after the second time I do it. One of your colleagues is on his feet. 
And I am certain that is one of the things Senator O'Sullivan is likely about to raise. Senator O'Sullivan. Mr President, I suffer from a condition called sensitive ear syndrome. <laughs> And uh, this is becoming a workplace health and safety issue for me, with the pitch coming from the other side. I'd ask that they just tone it down, please. Senators, that is the second, that is the second request we've had from a colleague who cannot hear the debate, despite being relatively close. So I ask senators to be considerate of their colleagues, even on a day when there is a little more attention on the Senate than normal. Senator, Senator Scullion, to continue your answer. Uh, my apologies, Mr. President. I just didn't hear. Um, the, the, uh, we, we have managed to have a record infrastructure spend. We've abolished the carbon tax. We've abolished the minor tax. We've restored integrity to our borders. But most importantly, most importantly, we have invested in Australia. Every one of those million families who have a job who can provide certainty to their family, who can provide an education to their children, that they can make sure that they are building a better future with confidence is all down to what we have actually achieved. Not any of those vague promises from the other side. This is a great coalition and we'll continue to order. support it. Order. Order. Senator Giorgio. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is directed to Simon Birmingham, who I understand represents finance matters for the government at the moment. <laughs> Minister, can you please clarify whether Western Australia's $4.7 billion GST is under threat or not? According to media reports today, Federal Treasurer Scott Morrison has warned that a coalition government under Peter Dutton could scuttle the deal for WA. Therefore, can you guarantee to my, my constituents that there is no threat to WA's GST deal, irrespective if there is a change in the government's leader. The Minister representing the Minister for Finance, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. I thank Senator Giorgio for his question. You know, I earlier went through a number of the achievements of the Turnbull government, and a very significant one that I failed Senator to Pratt. mention was the achievement of the government in terms of fixing inequities in relation to GST distribution. And that was something that was addressed with real reform, not the type of band-aid measures that Mr Shorten and those opposite proposed. You know, Mr Shorten used to spend— Oh, sorry, Senator Gallagher. So, thank you, Mr President. It just occurred to me that Senator Smith had more, may have more precise information in respect to answering this question Senator, <laughs> Senator Gallagher. than Senator Birmingham. Uh, Senator Gallagher, that's not a point of order, and it wasn't even a very good attempt to make it one. Senator Birmingham. GST reform is a key reform of the Turnbull government, of this coalition government, and I am confident it will be an enduring reform. In fact, I would be so bold as to predict that at some time, which I hope is a very long, long way away, that those opposite who have not given a straight answer in relation to our GST reform will actually just quietly accept it. At some time in the future, they will quietly accept it. But Mr Shorten was shown to be somebody incapable as a leader of making difficult decisions, of delivering the tough reform that our GST reform has indeed put in place. Our proposal is a real measure of reform. It will benchmark all states to the economies of New South Wales or Victoria. It will provide greater stability and predictability in the state's GST's payments. We are boosting the GST pool available for the states by providing an injection of $600 million in the pool in 2020-21 and a further $250 million in 2024-25, all of it to be indexed. I am confident that the only threat, the only threat to the GST arrangements are those opposite, because they have no policy in this space. They promised Band-Aid solutions. My WA Senate colleagues, each and every one of them, and the coalitions, the Liberal Party's Western Australian Lower House members, championed long and hard for real GST reform, not Labor's Band-Aid solution. And as a coalition government, we are proud to have achieved it. Senator Giorgio, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Will the government then send a letter to the state government to confirm the arrangements are intact to alleviate the fears? Premier Mark McGovern has expressed today in the media. Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr. President, I've just given a very categorical answer in regards to the fact that GST reform by this coalition government is here to stay, 
under this coalition government, any future coalition governments, and the only threat that exists is under a future Labor government. Because it is the Labor Party who squibbed it when it came to GST reform. Mr Shorten thought that a little bucket of money for some infrastructure project projects would be enough to buy off Western Australia. Whereas instead, Mr Turnbull, Mr Morrison, Senator Cormann and every single WA Liberal Senator and House of Representatives member worked hard, worked together to ensure we came up with a fair solution, an enduring solution that will ensure Western Australia gets its fair share of the GST, whilst ensuring every other state continues to enjoy funding growth from the GST pool to be able to invest into their essential services as well. Senator Giorgio, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. And given that the federal government is in turmoil at the moment, why won't the Commonwealth do the fair thing and ensure WA gets its full 75 cents in the dollar now rather than wait until 2024-2025? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, we've worked carefully to ensure the GST solution that we have proposed and that we are implementing is one that is fair to all states and territories, one that is fiscally responsible. It's one that we'll see in relation to Western Australia an additional $4.7 billion flow in terms of support for WA through GST payments. That is significant. We are pleased that it was welcomed by the WA Labor Party, notwithstanding the fact, of course, that they had no viable solution on offer from those opposite. And the next election in Western Australia will be one where the hollow man of Mr Shorten will be on display. Will be on display because, of course, he tried to buy WA off with a band-aid solution, whereas the coalition government, led by our WA team, made sure that there was a real solution in place for Western Australians to make sure that they get a fair share of the GST in the future without any detriment to any other state or territory. Order. Senator Wong, um, no, hang, can I take some advice from the clerk, only because custom and practice has been that there's a list, but I understand that the Leader of the Opposition does take some precedent. Take. Senator Wong. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the administration of the Commonwealth, namely that a this Senate has no confidence in the government, b that notes that the government can change its leader but it can never unite its party, and c calls on whoever is the Prime Minister to visit the Governor-General by no later than 5 p.m. today to call an election immediately so the people can decide who runs this country. Yeah. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Mr President, I thank the Senate. Well, Mr President, it is very clear from question time today why we should suspend and why we should debate this motion and why we should express no confidence in this government. It is very clear from question time today that Australia does not have a functioning government. Australia does not have a functioning government. We have a rabble, a rabble of self-interested people masquerading as the representatives of Australia. We have a leader of the government in the Senate who could not even answer the simple question of how many ministers there were. They don't even know how many ministers they have left in their cabinet and in their executive. We have a leader of the National Party up here who couldn't even say in whom he had confidence, in whom he had confidence as Prime Minister. He just said whoever it might be that the Liberal Party choose. The fact is, Mr President, members of the Senate, we, have, we don't have a government, we have a rabble. We have a self-interested rabble. Uh, just look at the, cross, at the benches opposite where we sit. We can see that they are disunited. But you know the one thing on which they're united? They're united on one matter and one matter only, their complete inability to govern. It is the only thing that unites them, their complete inability to govern. We see Minister Cormann, the leader of the government, or former Minister Cormann, Senator Cormann, the leader of the government, resigned. Senator Cash resigned. Senator Fifield resigned. Senator Fioravanti Wells resigned. Assistant Ministers Cecilia and McGrath, for those who have heard of them, resigned. A government that is now so devoid of talent, so devoid of numbers, 
and so devoid of unity that the most senior minister opposite is Senator Nigel Scullion. I mean, really, where are we? Where are we? But I do want to make this point about what we have seen this week. I mean, it has been an extraordinary spectacle. It has been an extraordinary spectacle of, 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 of disunity, of division, of personal hatred, of enmity and ill discipline. It has been all of those things. But the most telling aspect of what we have seen on, on offer this week is this. When you ask the question, who matters to the Liberal Party, you get one answer themselves. The only people that they, that they care about is themselves. They don't care about working Australians who are struggling with the cost of living. They don't care about pensioners who are trying to pay their electricity bill. They don't care about families who need to see a, G a GP. They don't care about Australians in crowded emergency departments or nurses run off their feet. They don't care about older Australians and their families waiting for home, home care packages. And they don't care about kids. Kids who want a decent education, interject all you like, Senator Mackenzie. Every Australian can see what your priority has been this week. It is holding on to government, holding on to government at all costs. It has not been to govern for the Australian people, and that is what we are sent here to do. We are here to represent the Australian people, and you are governing for you and not for them. The only people who matter to the Liberal Party are themselves. People will remember you know, the famous Menzies speech about the forgotten Australians that the Liberals always get doughy-eyed about. Well, you know what? You've forgotten every Australian but yourselves. You've forgotten everyone but yourselves. That's what we've seen this week over and over again with each act of ill-discipline, each act of hate, internal hatred, e each act of disunity, which has resulted in a government front bench which has Barry O'Sullivan down the end. That's what this has resulted in, a government that is entirely focused on itself, a government incapable of delivering to the Australian people. It's been a week where we've seen, it started actually last Friday, a man who is Prime Minister in name only and the clock is ticking, who, was, who capitulated on everything that he said was important. And we've seen that over and over again. And then we see Mr Morrison. well the man who once wanted the corporate tax cuts in the first place, and Mr Dutton, the worst health minister the country has seen and the architect of the GP tax. This is what is on offer to the Australian people, and they can't even sort it out. They can't even sort it out. Well, we say, Mr President, well, one, one, thing I would say, one thing I would say, at least this lot in here have bothered to turn up which is why we've actually got you know, the members of the press gallery here. At least we've, we actually had a Senate team who did bother to turn up. Of course, it's because they don't have the numbers to adjourn as yet. In the House, in the, House the Chamber of Government, the government abandoned the chamber. I mean, they ran away. They ran away from the parliament because they couldn't field a front bench and because the Prime Minister of the day had no confidence he could survive or nor the that the government could survive the day. I mean, they didn't even bother to turn up. So irretrievably divided, they have no interest in and no ambition to govern. Well, I think Australians have had enough. Absolutely. Australians have had Absolutely. enough. Australians know that the parliament deserves better, but most of, no, most of all, Australians know the Australian people deserve better. The Australian people deserve better. The Australian people deserve a government focused on their needs and not on the selfish, self-obsessed, hatred-filled gains we have witnessed minute by minute over this last week. And what is abundantly clear is that those opposite, the Liberal Party of Australia, perhaps a party in name only, cannot provide the leadership that the Australian people deserve. And what I say to them is this, if you can't provide that leadership, instead of running away from parliament and turning up here uh, with uh, you know, this, this huddle of ministers that you've been reduced to, you should resign. You should resign. You should resign you should call an election now and you should call an election so that people have a chance to elect a party who's actually interested in interested in the people themselves. 
enable the country to be governed by a party that actually looks to the needs of the Australian people, a government that is a stable and a united team that is focused on Australians and not on themselves, and a government that is committed to delivering what the Australian people need and what the Australian people want. Affordable and decent health care, education for all, based on ability, not post-world or wealth, decent care for our elderly, decent wages and proper penalty rates. And proper penalty rates. And it is absolutely clear that the only party that would be capable of delivering that government and governing for all Australians is the Australian Labor Party. I'm going to call Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, what matters most to the people of Australia are policies and outcomes. Policies and outcomes. And this government, this Liberal National Party government, has delivered good policies and strong outcomes in spades. We as a government stand proud of a strong record of achievement, a strong record of achievement, and we will continue to deliver on behalf of Australian families, on behalf of Australian households, on behalf of Australian businesses. We already went through in question time, but I am happy to remind the Senate, Mr President, of the significant achievements of this government, the significant achievements particularly in terms of working through the debt and deficit legacy left to us by the Australian Labor Party to the point, to the point where the budget comes back to balance in the next financial year. That's what people expect a good Liberal National Party government to do. And despite the obstruction and the opposition of those opposite, who at every single step, every step of the way, when a budget savings measure was proposed, they voted against it. They blocked it. They tried to be the wreckers and the destroyers in terms of repairing the budget. And notwithstanding, notwithstanding all that they did to block the efforts to repair the budget, we are in a position now where, because of the good work of an economic team, Mr. Cor Mr. Uh, Mr. Morrison, Senator Cormann, Mr. Turnbull, and the work indeed of Mr. Abbott and Mr. Hockey prior to that, because of that teamwork over that period of time, the budget comes back to balance, delivering what Australians think a good Liberal and national government should do, and we have delivered on that. Australians believe a good Liberal national government should, of course, as well, focus on jobs and growth. And jobs and growth is not just a slogan we took to the last election, it is a reality, an outcome. Some of the strongest economic growth in the developed world, strong economic growth that has actually delivered real benefits for Australians, real benefits in terms of jobs growth, jobs growth that has overwhelmingly been overwhelmingly been jobs growth of full-time employment. And as well as acknowledging our economic team, I pay tribute to Senator Cash for her work in terms of jobs growth around Australia, for her work as the Minister for Jobs and the Minister for Employment in ensuring that we have, we have jobs growth that has helped more Australians enjoy the dignity of work, enjoy the opportunity to get ahead. But what's more? What's more? Those Australians who have now got a job because of what our government has delivered are going to get to keep more of their hard-earned income. That's, right, yeah. That's a critical reform from this government. Because we've managed the economy strongly, because we've achieved strong economic growth, because we've achieved strong, strong jobs growth, we have been able to bring the budget back to balance and still be able to afford to legislate the most far-ranging tax cuts that Australia has seen. Tax relief that will affect and benefit all Australian hard-working households will ensure, will ensure that Australians, in terms of the income tax they pay, will no longer be forced and pushed into a higher income tax bracket. Bracket creep, bracket creep has been a disease that has afflicted the Australian workplace for too long, and the coalition government has passed legislation to address bracket creep in a significant way. But guess what? Guess what? What do the Australian people face when it comes to bracket creep if there were to be a change of government to those opposite? A return to bracket creep. Because the Labor Party plans to roll back tax cuts. They plan to roll back the tax cuts that this government has legislated. And in rolling back those tax cuts, bracket creep will be back on the deck for hard-working Australians. So as Australians work hard, as they seek to get ahead, 
as indeed as hard-working Australians right around the country go out and perhaps work an extra shift or an extra day. And you know one of the reasons they can do that? Because of our childcare reforms. This is a virtuous cycle for Australians. We've created more jobs. We've created the environment where wages are growing faster. We've created the circumstance where people can afford to work an extra shift or an extra day because, because they no longer have to pay so much in relation to childcare costs. And because of our tax relief, they're going to get to keep more of their hard-earned income. All of that, all of that is a threat. All of that is a threat because of those opposite. They promise, they promise to roll back the tax cuts for Australian households. They promise to roll back, to roll back tax cuts for small businesses. They, of course, voted against our childcare reforms. But it's not just the Australian economy that will be at risk, Mr President. Indeed, we know from past history that, of course, the Labor Party can't be trusted in relation to our national security interests either. That in relation to our national security interests, the Labor Party will no doubt once again team up with the Australian Greens and that we will see a weakening of our border protection policies. Because we've seen that happen before. We know the track record that Mr Rudd stood there. Do we remember, of course, Mr Rudd standing there before the 2007 election and promising, promising that in terms of economic management he would be a careful and prudent manager? And yet he blew the budget wide open. Blew the budget wide open, and it's taken five years of hard work and toil to bring it back to balance. Mr. Rudd, of course, also promised that when it came to national security and particularly to border protection, that he would keep all of the Howard government's policies. But what happened? What happened? Well, Mr. Rudd was found to be telling untruths. He lied to the Australian people before that election because once elected, the Labor Party systematically went about doing what the Australian Greens wanted them to, which was to dismantle those border protection policies. And that will happen again. It will happen again as clearly as day follows night. Because we know that those, those in the left wing of the Labor Party opposite, indeed some in the right, such as Senator Keneally, want to dismantle the border security policies that have saved thousands and thousands of Australian lives. And that, that will be a live topic when the Labor Party National Convention happens. No doubt that once again it will take backroom deals to stop embarrassing debate in relation to their reforms, into their policies. So, Mr. President, Mr. President, the Labor Party can come in here and they can seek, of course, to try to make this a debate about politics. But this government, this coalition government, will ensure that we continue. We continue to focus on the things that will matter to the Australian people in terms of good policies and good outcomes. Now, our careful economic management, our careful economic management that has delivered a strong economy, record jobs growth, the opportunity for wages growth, conditions for us to deliver tax relief also allows us to invest in the essential services that Australians rely upon. Despite the lies we hear from those opposite, there is a record and growing level of investment in Australia's health care and Australia's education system. We do it in a way that balances the budget but invest more in terms of the health and education for Australians. Despite the lies of those opposite, and we remember the Medicare scare campaign at the last election, we have record GP bulk billing rates, some 86.1 per cent in relation to bulk billing rates. Perhaps more importantly, we have listed or amended some 1,700 medicines on the PBS. PBS is particularly important in terms of essential services for Australians. It's important because it gives them access to groundbreaking new drugs at an affordable rate. But do you know what? Do you know what a consequence of the last Labor government was? that as the budget spiralled out of control under Labor, one of the steps they took was to stop listing PBS medicines, to deny Australians the opportunity to access those cheap, groundbreaking new drugs to help with their health care. That's what we saw last time around when it all went horribly wrong by those opposite. What we saw last time around was that the Australian Labor Party, in losing control of the budget, 
then took panicked measures such as stripping Australians of the right to new drugs that should have been listed on the PBS. This government, this Liberal and National Party government, has ensured that when recommendations are made through the Independent Pharmaceutical Benefits Advisory Committee, they are acted on. Yes. They are acted on. So what is at risk for Australians? What is at threat from those opposite? Jobs. Those opposite, higher taxes, weaker jobs growth. Those opposite, ultimately, balanced budget will be destroyed. From those opposite, weaker border protection. From those opposite, we will ultimately then see them go down that track record again, whether it's the PBS or something else. But the next election, due next year, will of course no doubt be another occasion when we will also see the despicable lies of those opposite. The despicable lies. We saw that in the last election campaign. Who could forget the way in which they rolled out the Medi-Scare campaign? They took the Medicare logo and they misused it. They took, of course, an approach of spreading lies and mistruths to scare Australian vulnerable people, pensioners and others. That, of course, is what we saw from those opposite. We saw an approach in the last election campaign where they tried to win it based on scare tactics. Order. Scare tactics that were completely untrue. Scare tactics that were based on lies. And Senator O'Neill, she was happily out there spreading it, of course. They can sit there and scream and yell because for them Order. it's always about politics. Senator, for us, it's about Senator policies and Senator O'Neill. We have worked as a government. Senator O'Neill. We have worked as a government to tackle difficult issues. Difficult, challenging issues. People said that we'd never managed to legislate our income tax cuts, and we did. People said that we would never manage to legislate to reintroduce the ABCC or the Registered Organisations Commission, but we did. People said we'd never legislate other key reforms the Labor Party and the Greens proposed reforms in my portfolio area, such as childcare, but we did. People said we'd never managed to legislate to be able to bring the budget back to balance, but we did through perseverance and hard work. People said that fixing the GST problem was an intractable problem, yet of course it wasn't intractable, not at all. All it took was hard work from a dedicated team to come up with a solution that is fair and reasonable to every Australian. And I challenge everyone opposite from Western Australia to go back there and to try to explain how it is that they never came up with a credible GST policy, and yet this Liberal National Party government did and is delivering it, and that is absolutely to the credit. In this place of Senator Cormann, of Senator Reynolds, of Senator Brockman, of Senator Smith, of Senator Cash, each and every one of them worked hard in a team to ensure that we delivered that reform. We tackled other difficult issues, difficult issues such as indeed the question around same-sex marriage. People said, people said that the plebiscite or a vote or giving Australians a say would never happen. It did happen. It did happen and we saw a strong endorsement for change and we saw this parliament then legislate that. Different people expressed their different opinions. That's what you expect on an important social reform like that. But this government provided the framework for that decision to be resolved, to ensure that it was resolved in a way to provide certainty for all Australians into the future. Mr President, when we go next year to an election, we will see that the Australian people have to make a choice about the next three years. And the choice that they will face, the choice that they will face, is absolutely a choice between the Liberal and National parties who have shown through our actions to date that we will back their interests. If Australians work hard, we will make sure they keep as much of their hard-earned money as they can. If they want to grow their business, we will make sure the circumstances are there to grow their businesses. If Australians want to make sure that they want to ensure that they can indeed start a business, we have created small business tax policies that are more competitive than what those on opposite have. But it will be a choice. Every election is a choice. And I'm going to give 
the Labor Party one bit of credit. They have released policies for the next election, policies for more than $200 billion of higher and additional taxes. Of higher and additional taxes. Order. That choice, that choice will be whether Australians want to pay higher taxes on their wages. I look around the full public gallery today. I doubt there are terribly many people in the public gallery or elsewhere who want to be paying higher taxes on their take-home wages. The question will be whether Australian retirees want to see higher taxes on their hard-earned savings. I mean, who would have thought that Mr Shorten would come up with a tax policy that went after the savings of retirees? But there are retirees in the gallery today. And I'll bet they don't want to be paying higher taxes on their savings. Of course, the Labor Party also has plans for higher taxes on Australian houses. People want to buy an investment property to get ahead to save a little bit for the future. The Labor Party still has a policy that will see higher taxes in relation to people doing that. And the result of that will be higher rents for many Australians. Lower property prices, a devaluation in terms of the major asset that many Australian households have. Australian small businesses face the threat of higher taxes. Vast majority of uh, so many Australians, more than 40 per cent of Australians, work in small businesses. Small businesses. And under the Labor Party, they will be paying a higher tax rate in those small businesses than what has been legislated by this parliament, by this Liberal and National Party government. The result of that will be those businesses have less money to invest, to grow, to create more jobs, to create higher wages. And of course, then there is in relation to electricity. This government has tackled again the difficult issue of electricity. Just this week, we have announced reforms that build upon the work we had already delivered as a government. We started out by making sure that we fixed issues around network Order. transmission costs. No more gaming of the system. No more gaming of the system by transmission networks and companies in terms of energy policy, but instead a clear, transparent Order. system where they can't gold plate infrastructure and slug people on their electricity bills for it. We ensured in relation to gas prices that gas prices were brought down. Again, something that many said couldn't be done. But this government made sure that it was clear to businesses who were doing the wrong thing by Australians that we would take whatever action was necessary to keep Australian gas here for Australian energy generation to drive down Australian electricity prices. We tackled the retail market and this week went even further in relation to the retail market. We have ensured that Australians will get in terms of electricity bills, a fair default price. No longer will Australian pensioners find that when they come out of an electricity contract, they have to go through the confusing or difficult choice of what electricity to contract to go on. Instead, because of our policy change, pensioners will know and can have confidence there will be a default price that is a fair and efficient price and that they will not be able to be ripped off by those electricity companies. And we can have confidence that they won't be ripped off by those electricity companies because we've put strong penalties in place as well. We've said that, of course, what is required is a range of penalties, including the power to force divestment of assets if required. Strong penalties to make sure there is clear action in that energy market. We've accepted and we're acting on those ACCC recommendations, including, including ensuring that more generation capacity can be built. So the choice for Australians could not be starker when it comes to next year's election. Choice between a low-taxing Liberal and National Party government or a high-taxing Labor government. A choice between a Liberal and National Party government where wages will be taxed at a lower rate or a Labor government where wages will be taxed at a higher rate. A choice between a Liberal and National Party government where small businesses will be taxed at a lower rate or houses will be taxed at a higher rate. A choice, a choice between a Liberal and National Party government where electricity bills will be lower or a Labor government where electricity bills will be higher. That is the choice that is on offer. People will not, in the end, risk their jobs, their wages, their homes, their retirement savings, the potential for lower electricity bills on that mob opposite. 
They will not risk the national security, the border protection of the country on that mob opposite. Because in the end, Australians care not about the political stunt of this motion. They care about good policy, good outcomes, and the Liberal and National Party coalition government here has delivered good policy, strong outcomes in spades, and hundreds of thousands and even millions of Australians are better off as a result of our doing so. Senate order, Senator Di Natale. Mr. President, um, I too uh, look at the people of the gallery who have joined us today, and I look at the many millions of Australians who are watching what's going on in this parliament, and what they're watching is a national embarrassment. It's a disgrace. It's utterly shameful. You know, we haven't had a stable government in this country for a decade now. I've got a 10-year-old boy and he's seen half a dozen different prime ministers. We have politicians in this joint who are far more concerned about themselves, about their own self-interest, than they are with governing the country. Just think, while the government, while the Liberal Party has been tearing themselves apart, We've got 100 per cent of New South Wales that's in drought right now. That's right. We've got the Great Barrier Reef that's on the brink of collapse. We've got floods in India. We've got a 12-year-old girl who's setting herself alight in Nauru. We've got kids who are in a catatonic state because they've given up hope, locked away in those offshore hell holes. What's the Liberal Party doing? Focusing on vengeance, on payback, focusing on themselves. We've got people who can't afford to pay their medical bills right now. We've got young people who are being priced out of an education. There are 100,000 people in this country who are homeless. There are women who fear going home tonight because one woman a week is killed at the hands of a violent partner. And what have we got? We've got this spectacle, this disgrace. You should be ashamed of yourselves. We have people across the country who are suffering, and look at what you're doing. You are so focused on yourselves that you have forgotten what the country elected you to do, and that is to govern for themselves, for them, not for you, not for you. You don't deserve to govern. You deserve to be turfed out. That's what you deserve. You walked away from climate change. You walked away from an energy policy. You ditched your economic plan. And why? Because those dinosaurs inside your party room held the Prime Minister to ransom and he didn't have the guts to take them on. And what's he done instead? What has, what has your party done? We now have the prospect of Peter Dutton or Scott Morrison as the next Prime Minister of this country. Now, things are pretty crook right now, but they're going to get a hell of a lot worse. I fear for those people in this country who have come from overseas, where we're going to have an election that focuses on race, that fans the, fle the, fl fans the flames of racism and division. That's what's coming right now. We're going to have an election campaign where people are divided, where neighbour is pitted against neighbour because you haven't got the guts to stand up and lead in this country. People have got a right to be angry right now. I understand why people feel angry. Of course they're angry. People haven't been, we haven't seen an investment in infrastructure. Our roads are choking. We haven't got a waste policy. Energy prices are going up. Of course they're angry. Young people can't afford to buy their own home right now. We've got young people who can't afford to get an education right now. No wonder people are feeling crook. No wonder they want to turf this mob out. But let me tell you, the answer is not your neighbour. It's not the person who's come from overseas. It's not the Italian or Greek or African. It's not someone who doesn't share your religion. It's this mob right here that you should look at. This mob right here who are doing the bidding of the big end of town, who are more interested in looking after their corporate mates than they are in looking after the people who elected them to this place. And rather than taking a stand, there was one person in this place who was more unhappy than those members sitting over there, and it was Senator Hanson. Do you know why Senator Hanson was unhappy? She's unhappy because she's seen a party, rather than standing up to her, adopting her policies. That's what she's seen. 
Rather than taking a stand against One Nation, the Liberal Party are becoming just like them. A bunch of anti-immigrant climate deniers with no economic plan. You are a disgrace. You should hang your heads in shame. Now, let make no mistake. We are going to take it right up to you, Bob, in the next election. To all those people who are listening right now who feel scared. Senator Dinner Taylor, to those I, people Senator, I, I have shown some liberal, a liberal approach in this debate, but comments should be directed to and through the chair and members in the other place referred to by their appropriate title. Well, through you, Mr. President, make no mistake. Right now, there are many people across this country who are frightened, who are worried about what the next election has in store for them. That speech we heard from Fraser Anning last week, that is a taste of things to come. When we have a Prime Minister whipping up fear around African order. immigrants— Order. Senator Dinatale on a point of order. Senator Williams, Senator Williams on a Mr. point of order. Mr President, you just made a point to Senator Dinatale to refer to those now the place by the correct title. I ask you to do the same here as well. Civility costs nothing, absolutely nothing. Very true, Senator Williams. Senator Di Natale, you know the rules of debate. Please, uh, please uh, refer to people by their appropriate titles. Mr. Senator President, Di Natale. When, when we have the Prime Minister of this country whipping up fears around African immigrants, when we have the potential future Prime Minister of this country saying that Lebanese Muslims were a mistake to be brought into this country, when we have the future Prime Minister of this country blame refugees for taking people's jobs and taking welfare, we know what's in store. We know what's in store. The next election is going to be ugly. It's going to be a calculated attempt at race baiting. It's going to be a calculated attempt at trying to win over One Nation voters who have got a right to be angry at governments for letting them down. But the enemy is not your neighbour, Mr President. It's not that person who's chosen Australia to make their home. The enemy is that political and economic system that has been bought by vested interests, by big corporations, who make those massive donations to both sides of politics so that they can get what they want and everybody else be damned. That's what we are facing. In a few months, we will be facing an election. I say to the people of Australia, I say to all of you in the gallery, the Greens are with you. We will fight this every step of the way and we will not let you win. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. Order. We Senator have Hanson. got the eyes of Australia that is watching this chamber at the moment. We've got people in the gallery who are actually watching. I'm ashamed of what's actually going on at the moment. I feel that this censure motion put before the parliament by the Labor Party is nothing but political point scoring. They say there is a dysfunctional government. I disagree. Even today on the floor of parliament, we are, still we are still debating legislation, and that is going through this chamber. Yes, there are problems within the, the Liberal Party about the leadership, but people in glass houses should not throw stones. How long ago was it the, the Gillard, Rudd, Gillard, or should I say the Rudd, Gillard, Rudd? fiasco that happened. You've even just a couple of months ago that if you had lost um, any of the Super Saturday seats, you would have been facing a le leadership challenge by Albanese and for the Labor Party. So don't throw stones. This is political point scoring at its utmost. There is no reason for a censure motion, and you, that was a political speech if I ever heard one, and you're gearing up for the next election. To listen to Senator Di Natale and his comments again also, as if it's you know, just about to break down. My God, talk about fear-mongering. That's all I've heard from the, from the Greens in this place is fear-mongering, that the reef is dead, that they want to shut down the farming, they've got no problems with you know, vegetation management, um, the, that the water is actually rising, we're all going to be flooded, and of course the climate is completely out of out of control when scientists say if you shut down everything, electricity, if you shut down cars, traffic, indus industry, lights turn the lights out, nothing will change whatsoever. That's fear-mongering if I've ever heard anything. As far as immigration, um, they want to open up the floodgates for unlimited numbers, numbers coming into this country, plus also the fact of refugees. Plus they want to give about 12 
billion, dollars, if not more, away to foreign aid. They don't care. I rarely hear them talk about the people in this country, the struggling farmers or anyone else. All they're worried about is other people in other countries around the world. Well, I suggest to them get out of this place and go and seek um, uh, a political future in another country. That's all they seem to talk about is people around the world. I will not apologise for wanting to represent the Australian people to ensure they have a decent standard of living and a way of life. If the, if the common sense prevails on who is the government here to look at the policies that I have put forward, so be it. The whole thing is that this is a censure mo motion and I believe that it should not be shut down. I'm going to call on my colleagues in this parliament. In all fairness, you have to say that legislation in this chamber is still working. The people of Australia expect us to do a job, to be working for them. And I say, let's continue to work for them. This parliament shuts down tonight. Let it run its course. Don't shut it down. Don't let the political party of the Labor, the Labor have a point scoring in about um, the censure motion. That's what it's about. The Liberal Party will sort out their leadership, but this, we are still working. We are here as elected senators in this place and keep working for the people because that's what the people in these galleries expect of us, each and every one of you. Expect us to be here working for them. They're sick and tired of this rabble. Even, even across the chamber, you all sat there and all you can do is scream across the chamber. Order. You are, Senator you are Hanson, not... please resume your seat. Senator Collins on a point of order. Thank you, uh, Mr President. There seems to be some confusion about the motion that's before the Senate. It uh, is a motion of no confidence, not a censure motion. And uh, it seems that uh, Senator Hanson doesn't quite understand what a censure well, you, motion you, you, is, nor what a no confidence you, motion you, you, is or means to the program. You've made your point, Senator Collins, and it's on the record now. Senator Hanson. Thank you. I will take the back. Um, I was wrong. It's not a censure motion, but a no confidence in the government. And that's not the case. They are still working, and as long as they still are presenting the legislation here on the floor of Parliament, <clears throat> I will support that, and I will not be supporting. I will not be supporting the Labor Party's Order. vote of no confidence in the government at all. Order. So I'm. Senator it is, up, it is up to the people of this nation. When an election is called, the people will have their say at the ballot box based on what this government has done and based on what your policies will be. And on your past performances, you've got a lot to answer for. You are not imperfect. That's, you're, not, you're not perfect, that's for sure, because your policies have destroyed this country as well. And the people have not forgotten. You, are, you cannot manage the economy. You have bad economic managers, and yes, I don't always support the government either. And you, you, you all wait. You also say yourselves the fact is you're not prepared Order to work for this left. country because when you actually have good policies, you are not prepared to back it on behalf of the, of the people of this nation. You actually knock it back. Even on my private members' bill that I tried to put up here on Monday to debate about immigration, what did you do? You censured it. You stopped it. You stop debate. You actually would not allow me to discuss that, to put it up at the next election for the people of this country to have a say about immigration. You actually stopped it. The Labor Party with the Greens, supported by Senator Anning's vote, which actually stopped debate for the people of this country to have a say in immigration, because you want to open up the floodgates. Why don't you tell the people the truth about where your policy is heading? Because they are actually feeling the effects of high immigration in this country, because they cannot deal with it. And the Liberal Party Order. have not dealt with it either, because that's the big elephant in the room that has such an impact in, on this country is high immigration numbers, plus rising cost of electricity. And you sit here in this place and you're all worried about your jobs. That's what it's all about. You're all worried about your jobs. But here we have the farming sector that is actually Order. on it's the farming sector. Order on my left. The farming, you, you don't like it, do you? 
You don't like it when you copy back the truth. Address and the your farming comments to the sector chair, Senator is Hanson. on its knees. And you know who's coming to their aid? The Australian people, donating out of their own pockets, who, who are giving donations, even other farmers that have gone through tough times. They're donating feed and fodder to their fellow farmers. And what, is you, what have both sides done? You haven't done enough. It's too little too late. The Australian people know what you've done. The Australian people, and all you're doing is worrying in this place about your own futures. You're looking after your own backsides. You don't care about the people out there. I hardly ever see you really fight and stand up there for them. But I tell you what, I've got to guess what? You've got me for another four years at least, and I'm going to be in this parliament. And whoever is on this side of the chamber, I will damn will hold you to account by the Australian for the Australian people. Order. Because you are not doing the right thing. Listen to what the people want. Lower the, the rise in cost of electricity. Look at immigration. Stop foreign ownership of our land. Order. And, and see the, the destruction of our industries and manufacturing and get jobs for our youth. There's no future for the youth in this country. You've done nothing to address that. You have Labor Party again. You're going on about apprenticeship schemes and you have a go at me. At least I'm trying to do something for them. You've actually destroyed the TAFE colleges. You shut them down. You have done nothing about apprenticeships whatsoever. And I've got to give credit to, to the coalition on their ABCC bill that Michaela Cash, Senator Cash, she fought for that. And that has seen progress in this country, where there was union thuggery, bullying that went on, shut down businesses, and that has now increased in, in, in the country. So, what I actually, um, so I will be here for another four years, and I'll call for accountability in this parliament, and I'll call it for what it is. Because you know what, the people may not always agree with me, and I'd be, and I'm upfront and honest with them. But they know that what I say, they expect the truth out of me, and they get the truth out of me. Not like either, either side here. You will only say what suits you. That you'll only say what suits you to see when you can get Senator your next Carr. vote from. So start to wake up and be representatives for the people in this parliament with truth, truth and honesty. Senator Hinch. Thank you, Mr. President. I shall be brief. Uh, I'm old enough in this place to uh, remember the days we used to all um, laugh at the Italians. We said, how often they change their government? How often they change their leaders? What a stupid country that was. How irresponsible and what a lousy case of, of democracy. And here we have now, tomorrow, it would seem that an elected Prime Minister will not make it his full term. An elected Prime Minister who I believe, seeing the people of Australia elected him, whether it had been Prime Minister Shorten or Prime Minister um, Turnbull, um, should be, was elected by the people and should serve his or her full term in government. And I'm sorry that that will not happen, because tomorrow it would appear that we will now have either a Prime Minister Dutton or a Prime Minister Morrison or a Prime Minister Pine or a Prime Minister Bishop, uh, can we? They're all doing it. They're all doing the numbers. I'm, I'm told they're all doing the numbers. They're all doing the numbers. Now, and I'll, I'll, I'll concede. I'll concede. I'll, I'll criticise this government and I'll vote against this government. I think what they did in the, in the other place today was a bloody disgrace. They have shut down democracy and the workings of the place. And I agree with Senator Cameron sometime with these rabble. They're a rabble. They're a terrible rabble at times, and they are at the moment. They are at the moment. We do not know who's going to be uh, in the ministry tomorrow. We don't know who you're going to ask questions of. Uh, I'll concede a bit with Senator Hanson that the government obviously must still be doing some sort of work somewhere. Uh, but um, I, mean, I guess there's a chance we may have a, a Prime Minister term if they can't find the 43 signatures. But I still say, though, that I believe a government is the government, that it should not be up to us. Uh, Senator Wong should not be us for, for up to us to decide when they should go to the polls, when they should have an election. This, this government, this, because they elected, the people elected this government, Senator Carr, and this government should decide, and whoever the new Prime Minister is tomorrow, he should decide or she should decide where, he should decide or well, she should decide when we should have an election. And I don't know, Senator Carr, through the chair, Senator Carr, I do not know. We don't know. But, but when that, when that Prime Minister is elected by the party room tomorrow, it is up to them to decide when they call an election. Not for you to call an election. Order. Not for me, for them. So I would say that... Uh, Senator Carr. Do you want to take your turn? Or? 
Senator Carr. Do you want to take the rest of my turn, Senator Carr? Senator Hinge, please continue your remarks. And Senator Carr, please. Uh, through the chair, Senator, I need to say that I, should, I, I believe a government should have the right to call an election when they want to, even though they may be so unpopular that we want them to have an election. But uh, I'll be voting with the government on this one. Senator Bernardi. Senator thank, Bernardi. Thank you, Mr. President. If the Australian people weren't alarmed enough, Senator Hinch has sent a shiver, a horror, through all of their spines by mentioning Prime Minister Payne. It, is, it, is, it conjures this, this country with dread to think that not only has our political system become a bit of a laughing stock, but that such thoughts could be taken even seriously, remotely with seriousness in this place. Um, I perfectly understand why Senator Wong has moved this motion of no confidence. Um, if you look at the government's track record, it has been dreadful, to say the least. Not only have they, have they refused to deal with some of the issues that need to be dealt with, they've messed around with people's superannuation, they've run a chaotic and dysfunctional government, they've thrown everything up into the air to say um, it's on the table, which basically means they've got no firm principles and no framework in which they're going to discount even the most idiotic proposals. We've had a government that has been committed to emissions trading schemes and they've snuck them through. They've discussed about a, a, a tax on car emissions. We've had a tax on lawnmowers and two-stroke engines. We've got this um, a year's worth of, of national electricity guarantee work that was abandoned under the face of a bit of pressure. We've got money being sent off to um, bodies without enough scrutiny, $443 million to the, National, to the uh, Great Barrier Reef Foundation. We've got, we've got billions of dollars or hundreds of millions of dollars shipped off to the Clinton Foundation, the United Nations, signing up to Paris. You can go through all the litany of failures in this government. And it's probably it's why. It's why I'm no longer a part of the Liberal Party. And that judgment was one that I made because I couldn't go along with it. But for every failure on this side, and the base politics of moving a no-confidence motion is very straightforward, it is, it is repeated on the other side of the chamber, because they've done, this, they've done worse. They've, they've knifed two prime ministers. At the moment, the Liberal Party's only knifed one. <laughs> right? you can go, they've got bigger emissions trading targets. They want to outsource more of Australian sovereignty to international organisations. They want a basically an open border policy. You know they're going to tax and spend. They're going to tinker and work harder against people's superannuation again. They're going to tax, put, change capital gains tax. They're going to over, overturn negative gearing, which is a, a principle of business. And they cannot tell you whether they're going to apply it to commercial property, to share transactions, to residential property. We know that half of them have sold out to China, but we also know that that's happened on this side as well. It is, it is shameful what politics has become. And the, and the crisis, which you can look around the place and you can ask the Australian people, they render it with their votes, because about 30 or 40 per cent of the people now are voting outside of the major parties. That is where the vote of no confidence is coming. And I regret, I regret that has allowed um, some base opportunism to, to spring up for, for people who are in positions of influence to wield it for their personal gratification, to grandiose and big note themselves, rather than do something that is actually in the best interests of the country. On that side, they say they want to spend $40 billion on education. On this side, it was $18 billion on education, all unfunded, all uncosted, and there's no educational outcomes available for it. And what did the crossbench do? Say $18 billion wasn't enough, let's put another $5 billion of borrowed money into it. However you want to look at the decision-making that is taking place in the last decade of parliament, it is no wonder the Australian people are losing faith and confidence in the body politic. And we are all guilty of it to a degree. We will all complain about the other team, but the people we are letting down are the Australian people. The mums and dads who are finding it difficult to pay their utility bills. Every problem in the electricity market is caused by government interference, government determinations and regulations. Every single one. Every time an Australian person can't afford to pay their electricity bills, we should be hanging our heads in shame. And it's because of blind ideology, because this was as forecastable and foreseeable 
as, as anything else, just as is the crisis that is engulfing the Liberal Party now. The move against Tony Abbott three or so years ago was textbook, textbook repeating the same failures and the same damage that was done by the Labor Party in getting rid of Kevin Rudd. It doesn't matter whether Kevin Rudd was a dysfunctional human being or Tony Abbott was a good Prime Minister. In the end, in the end, you know that's true, Senator Gallagher. In the end, the Australian people have come to expect that the person they elect to be their Prime Minister would at least see out a term. That has been the convention. And when you dump convention, you dump the integrity of the system. And that is what we've done. And the people on the Liberal side of the chamber, the people on the Liberal side of the chamber who orchestrated and, and participated in that coup should be hanging their heads in shame. Because somehow they thought we can take Labor's policy, we can take Labor's policy and somehow make it turn out better. Well, what they did, they took Labor's policy, they essentially took Labor's rejected candidate, because let's remember Mr Turnbull lined up there with Graham Richardson and others. Uh -huh. Seeking Labor pre-selection, they said no. We've got enough no, narcissists in our motion. party already, and so he made this migration across to the coalition, where he has systematically sought to reshape it and change it in his image, which is not the traditional Liberal Party image. Now, like it or lump it, and I say this to the Australian people: like it or lump it, this mob or this mob, the green, the red team or the blue team, are going to be running a government of some sort after the next election. The choice for you is who is going to influence and shape their outcomes. Who in this place can be trusted to put the Australian people's interests first rather than naked political opportunism first? And you can only look, you can only look around the crossbench and, who, and to ask who has acted in every vote with principle, not with shameless self-aggrandisement or political opportunism or something to extract to boast about, but who is seeking to improve legislation or voting on either side of the chamber according to the merits of it. And I say I'm not the only one who's endeavoured to do that. There are others in this chamber as well. There are others in this chamber. But we cannot, we cannot let the Australian people down through these shameless acts of partisanship, because the only ones that are being let down are the Australian people, who once had faith in this institution, who once had confidence that the people up here were actually going to act in their interests. It's time for that to happen again. The, the, the font and the wisdom of all knowledge is not vested in this place. We have to think that the Australian people can make some determinations and decisions for themselves. And that is the challenge for us. That is the challenge. to get. Rather than government out of people's lives, because we haven't improved it at all in the last 10 years, but we need to have a very light touch on their lives so that they can make these decisions themselves. Quite frankly, I do believe, as, as, as I am not a, a personal fan of the Prime Minister, um, I do believe that ultimately these things should be handled at the ballot box for a Prime Minister. Uh, it is an indictment on this place, as Senator Hinch said, an indictment on this place that Italy looks like the paragon of, of political stability now, because we haven't had a Prime Minister since John Howard that has actually lasted a full term after their election. That is a reflection on every single one of us, who are, who are people who have participated in the games to bring down successive Prime Ministers. I know we relish it when it's on the other side, but I look here from the crossbench and I say, shame. It's a shame for all of us. It's a shame for the Australian people. Um, and Mr. Mr President, I won't be supporting this no confidence motion because I do understand it is based politics um, and I, as I made in my opening remarks, uh, whatever the errors of this side, they have only ever been reflected uh, or compounded, um, sometimes even uh, exceeded by the errors of the other side. And so I'm not going to support a motion of um, what I regard as uh, 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 political intent but based around hypocrisy. I understand yeah. there have been discussions around the chamber about a speaking order, which I'm happy to comply with. So I'll go to Sc Senator Scullion first. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. In the short time I have, I'd uh, first of all rise and say uh, uh, 
No, I don't support the motion, uh, but I'd just like to reflect on some of the opening remarks, and I think it's an insight into the character of the, of the Labor Party, Mr President. You can, you can recall Senator Wong, arrogant, derisive, sneering. What's Senator Scullion doing at this end? <laughs> What's Nigel doing here? You know? Not really sure what reflection, probably a personal reflection, but it's, it's more likely he's from the Territory. or He's, he's, from, he's from the bush. He was, shouldn't really be here. You know, they're the sort of reflections. Uh, or for, maybe he's order. from the National order. Party. Senator maybe that Scullion, was the reflection. Senator Scullion, on a, oh, I've got Senator Collins on a point of order. Yes, the point of order oh, is really? uh, the reflections that uh, Senator Scullion are talking about is simply questions about why he's not sitting on national benches and why he was brought forward into Liberal benches and questions about whether he has moved into the Liberal Party. Senator, there was no sneering Senator, or arrogance uh, or rudeness Collins, in the way he suggested. I'll, I'll let you um, explain that point. That is a matter for debate as long as people aren't making inappropriate reflections on one another. I'll call Senator Scullion to continue. Thanks, thanks very much, Mr President. And uh, I was standing so I understand exactly what was said and the manner in which it was said. But perhaps again is that uh, I'm not as important, you know. I'm only the Minister for Aboriginal uh, and Torres Strait Islander Affairs. You know, that's that's perhaps what it is, because because Penny was actually a minister in the day for finance, and we can all remember how that went, Mr. President. We can all remember how that went. She was left. Senator Wong was left with a glory box, 20 billion dollars in the bank. Six billion dollars in an education order, uh, Senator fund. Scully and Senator McCarthy on a point of order. A point of order, Mr. President. Uh, could the minister refer to the leader of the opposition or in the Senate in the appropriate manner, please? Um, well, that would, is an appropriate point of order. I missed it. If it was inappropriate, people. We should refer to each other by their titles. Senator Scullion. Uh, so we have a six billion dollar infrastructure uh, education infrastructure fund. Uh, another multi uh, billion dollar. Uh, telecommunications fund, and nobody knew where it went. It, it's all gone. But one of the great records of those opposite, driven from their leader who drips scorn and derision on ordinary people, uh, which is the dark heart of the Labor Party, mm. they had a record debt. That was their race to debt: 240 billion in debt. 240 billion in debt. And let me tell you, at that trajectory, we would have reached a trillion dollars, Mr. President, a trillion dollars in debt. So I don't like particularly being lectured by those opposite about what sort of a hierarchical place we might have in life. And can I say, every single thing that we hear from the other side, you'd reckon that regional or rural Australia didn't even exist, Mr. President. The, the sort of things that we've done for drought relief, for record investment in infrastructure, we now have 21st century communications, we've got doctors and health professionals into the regions, uh, the effects test, we've got the country of origin labelling, uh, we've had decentralisation, we're supporting agricultural industries with tax relief, we're backing miners' resources, the industry and energy. We are governing this country. We are governing this country in a much better way than you would ever dream then you would have agreed. So any of the crocodile tears about the dysfunction Order. because someone's changing leaders Order. and it's not a pretty sight, then that is just crocodile tears. Those people who ask, who is the Prime Minister? Well, I can assure you it's not the member for Grey and Errol, Sydney or Blacksland and McMahon or Lindsay, and most importantly, it won't be the member for Maribyrnong. Yeah, yeah. Senator Cameron. Uh, thank you. Uh, Madam oh, Deputy um, President. I beg your pardon, Senator Cameron. Um, the President just may be aware there's a speaking it? order, so I think it goes okay. to Senator Stora. My apologies, Senator Stora. Oh, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy President. I, I won't be supporting uh, this motion. I do not believe it's appropriate that the Senate uh, uh, pass judgment on the, uh, the, the government in this manner. Uh, the, we are as senators, and the uh, Senate has convened and is working today. And uh, the uh, the uh, Government has presented to ministers to ask, ask her questions, and, and I think this is uh, appropriate that we uh, continue to do so. So, uh, I do not believe that it's a, appropriate for the uh, for the Senate to be calling to um, the uh, Prime Minister to act. We, there is a Prime Minister, and there's a process going on. But this is uh, a very in, embarrassing situation for Australia, and it is no wonder that uh, many many voters are leaving major parties and voting for uh, independents and other uh, cross-party 
crossbench parties. And uh, we've heard from some of them today, and many of the sentiments made in part by some of the crossbench ring very true. Um, we have um, significant uh, issues at stake in, in, uh, to deal with in Australia, and particularly with regards to energy policy, for example, is one that needs uh, the people need trust or, uh, and certainly even business uh, certainty for to move forward. And there's no guarantees of affordability or where it's going in terms of uh, sustainability, uh, environmental, and it's certainly that a need for uh, the government to um, move forward. But I believe that you know, there is a prime minister in place. The, the government will look to uh, change its leader. Uh, it's unfortunate that this is occurring, and it, it should not be so. The Australian people are, are voting uh, in, on a three-yearly three basis. Uh, to choose a, 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 a party to represent them and also senators, and uh, there should be a, a appropriate uh, processes such that the uh, government can govern and, and lead forward. And Australia does not want to see the continual um, knifing of, of leaders, as has occurred over the last 10 years. So, I, I echo um, many of the uh, sentiments of, of the crossbench here today. I, I hope that the Australian people out there can look to have a representation uh, both in the lower house but also in senators that will approach uh, legislation on its merits as, as per this house of review and uh, will do so in, in principles of integrity and, and fairness and sustainability and with an eye to the prosperity of the Australian people as a whole and uh, therefore I uh, I'm not calling for uh, the, the uh, government to, uh, you know, the lack of, that the government should uh, seek an, a new election. We have an uh, election coming uh, within the uh, next uh, uh, year, and uh, the, the Australian people, I think, wish to see the government uh, take its course and have their judgment made at that time, and they can seek to have uh, both representatives in the lower house, but also importantly, uh, senators that will uh, independently review legislation as brought forward by the government of the day uh, in under uh, reasonable and uh, decent principles. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Storer. Senator Rex. Uh, <laughs> Senator Patrick. Sorry. Thank you, Madam Deputy Chair. Uh, Senator Alliance will be abstaining from this motion. <coughs> it's clear. That, uh, no, it's clear that there are problems on the other side of the chamber, but uh, perhaps best characterised as a mess in transition. Uh, so it's, it's kind of hard to support uh, a motion of no confidence uh, in the context that I'm sure over the, the coming days we will see an outcome of, uh, uh, of the uh, decision over who will lead the party. Uh, it's not as though we haven't seen this sort of thing happening on, uh, on this side of the chamber, and uh, they managed to steer their way through that. So I think it's a bit too early to tell. Uh, and as I said, uh, we'll uh, reserve our right. We'll examine what happens, and uh, uh, we'll revisit this question if it's necessary. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Senator Cameron. Yeah, uh, thank you, Madam uh, Deputy President. Uh, I just uh, stand to support this vote of no confidence in this so-called government. And what I have to say. Uh, to Senator Scullion, it's not about you. This is not about Senator Scullion. This is about getting a government that can actually deliver the issues that the country desperately want a government to deal with. Dealing with health, dealing with education, getting a decent TAFE system, and for young kids here, dealing with climate change. I mean, the Arctic is on fire, and these people are just carving each other up. I mean, there is so much that we need to do in this country to build a decent society for the future. And I have to say that cannot be done. That cannot be done with some of the contributions that were made here. I just want to say to Senator Birmingham, I know that the murder press are blaming you for where we are. I think you've got some responsibility, but not all responsibility. Not all responsibility. I mean, what we've seen in this place over the past period of time is an absolute obsession by the Liberals and the Nationals with each other. They don't care 
about what's happening in the rest of the country. They don't care that working people are losing their penalty rates. They don't care that working people have a wage stagnation. They don't care that many families are struggling to put food on the table. They don't care that some pensioners can't afford to get an operation when it's needed. They don't care that the public health system is in trouble. They don't care that the education system is being built for the elite. This is about ordinary working Australians getting a government that works for them. And that's why the Prime Minister, if he is the Prime Minister now, I'm not sure, should actually go to an election and let the public make the choice. Because the choice is clear, and you've seen it here today with these contributions. The choice is the extremists in the Liberal and National Party linking up with Senator Hansen, linking up with Senator uh, uh, Hansen. We are going to have huge problems with this government, absolutely huge problems. Senator Anning's speech here the other day was about trying to take votes off Senator Hansen, and what's been happening in the Liberal Party is the Liberal Party falling apart because they want to pitch to the worst elements in our society. That's where we are. What Labour cares about is getting a government that can actually work for Australians, a government that understands the key issues for Australian work working families, a government that is not prepared, as this government did in 2014-15, attack pensioners. Because if it would have been up to this government, pensioners would be about $80 a week worse off under that 2014-15 budget. And who's standing for the leadership uh, of, the, uh, of the Liberal Party? You know, Peter, uh, Peter Dutton, the former health minister under the former Prime Minister Tony Abbott. And what was his contribution? To, the, to society, a cut of $57 billion to the public health system. This is the guy who is standing up and saying, vote for me to be the Prime Minister. I mean, the experiment with the Liberal Party has failed. The experiment was to put someone who was supposed to be a moderate to stand up and appeal to the centre ground of Australia as the Prime Minister of the Liberal Party. The extremists, the far right in the Liberal Party and National Party, were never going to let that happen. And because Prime Minister Turnbull did not have the courage or the backbone to stand up to the far right who will line up with Senator Hansen, because he didn't have that courage, they just demanded more and more from him, and he gave up his values, he gave up his principles, and he, he capitulated to this mob. We must have an election, because we can't have Senator Hansen here pushing her division in a position of power in a Liberal National Party. Senator Hansen came from the Liberal Party. Senator Hansen should go back to where she came from. She should join the Liberal Party. She could be a minister in the Liberal Party. That's how poor the talent is in the Liberal Party. She could be a minister, maybe sometime in the future. But what we need is a Labour government who looks after the public in this country, who wants kids to get a decent education, who want people who are ill to get access to health care to make sure that workers can bargain and not have their wages stagnate. These are the issues that are important in this country. We must not allow the extremists like Senator Hansen and those that are trying to pull down, well, those who have pulled down this government, because this government's gone. This government's gone. We must go to an election and we must get a decent, stable government in this country, and that can only be the Labour Party. Senator Wong. Thank you. 
Uh, as mover and reply, I will make a very few points. A number of crossbench senators uh, made the statement that the people elected the government and used that as an explanation of why they don't wish to support the no confidence motion. And I say this to them. Yes, the people elected this government. But that does not provide an unfettered right. That does not provide an unqualified right. It provides a responsibility. It gives a responsibility. Uh, and what we have seen this week, what all of us have observed, uh, is a party and a government that has walked away from that responsibility. A party and a government that has no regard for the heavy and weighty and on, 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 honourable responsibility that is conferred after winning an election. What we know is their hatred for each other is greater than their love for this country. What we know this week is that enmity has triumphed over responsibility. The reality is Australians have no confidence uh, in this government and neither should this parliament. So the question is that the motion as moved by Senator Wong be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the ayes have it. No, no. Division required? Ring the bells for four minutes.
Hey, Gene, so many signatures that we got now. Gene. Lock the doors. The question is the motion moved by Senator Wong be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Urquhart teller for the ayes and Senator Fawcett teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 31, noes 35. The matter is resolved in the negative. Order. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Are there any motions to take note of answers? I will wait for Senator. I'll wait for senators to clear the chamber. Senator McCarthy. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Birmingham and Senator Scullion to the questions asked by Labor senators. And let me say from the outset, uh, Madam Deputy President, uh, being unable to explain to this Senate how many ministers there are in the is it the Turnbull government, how many ministers there are, and the inability. Uh, for the members opposite to be able to explain to this Senate that they don't know. Just tell us. That's what you're there for, to take the questions on notice, to stand and defend what is meant to be the government of this country, to have no ability to be able to say to this Senate that you know the answer to that question, and then to hear uh, the Minister for Indigenous Affairs stand and go through a roll call of what was important about the coalition relationship, where even he could not even say who the Nationals would support. Madam Deputy President, 
in terms of a prime minister for this country, where the minister, Nigel Scullion, could not stand up and support Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull. The Nationals say they won't enter into the debate, as we heard in the minister's repl reply this afternoon, a reply that got shut down so many times, in fact, we didn't really know where he was going most of the time. It's interesting to note as well that these events in Canberra are bringing back memories, Madam Deputy President, for many in the Northern Territory about the infamous yeah. midnight coup, the coup that wasn't against the then Chief Minister Adam Giles. And let me remind you of those events in February 2015. It was also a government in crisis, a government of rich conservative incompetence, a government whose self-interest and infighting failed the people of the Northern Territory and who ultimately led to the near annihilation of the CLP. Certainly lessons to be learned about democracy in this country. To have the House closed down, adjourned to the people of this country, is an absolute disgrace, Madam Deputy President. To have democracy in this country mocked to such an extent where the opportunity to question, to debate, is locked to the members of the other House, but even more importantly, locked to the Australian people. <clears throat> Madam Deputy President, it is Australians who have really been impacted this week, Australians who have expected pieces of legislation to be, dis to be debated, important bills like the cashless card that we were talking about in here, CDP, where 30,000 CDP participants are wondering what is happening with their future and the breaches that are taking place. These are the issues that matter. But there was also other events taking place across the country. There was the biggest gathering at the Lakemba Mosque in Sydney, which was attended by some 30,000 Muslims this week. But the parliament wouldn't know it, and the people of Australia wouldn't be able to know it because it wasn't talked about. Many braced the cold winter morning to conduct a special rain prayer for the worst affected areas in this country. The prayers were conducted throughout the states of New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland. And while the instability, the self-interest and self-indulgent conversations, backbiting was taking place here, there were Australians out there who were reaching out to fellow Australians to our farmers, to the regions of Australia that are suffering in drought. But you wouldn't know that that huge story was taking place out there because there was too much focus on what was going on in here, or in fact not going on in here, Madam Deputy President, leading this country, governing, being responsible in terms of our responsibilities as elected members representing the people of Australia. 30,000 Australians were out there, but you wouldn't know it. 30,000 Australians, Muslims, praying for rain, praying for the farmers who are suffering. Compare that story to the one Thank in here. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. Your time has expired. Senator Still. After you, Senator Reynolds. Thank Senator you, Reynolds. Uh, Madam. Thank you very much, Senator Stirl. Uh, through you, um, Madam Deputy Chair, and thank you. I too rise to take note of um, what was discussed at question time today. And first of all, I'd just like to say that yesterday here in this place, I said that I was deeply saddened and distressed by what it was happening over the last 24 hours and now 48 hours in my own party. And I have got to say that what's happened since I spoke in this chamber yesterday. Um, even, I'm even more greatly distressed and disturbed by what has been happening, particularly last night and this morning in my own party. In fact, some of the behaviour is behaviour that I simply do not recognise and I think has no place in my party or in this chamber. So whatever happens over the next 24 hours, um, I cannot condone 
or can, and I cannot support what has happened to some of my colleagues on this side, in this, this chamber, in this place. And um, I think the tragedy of what has been happening, I think the madness of uh, what has uh, taken hold of uh, a number of my colleagues, is that this has been a very good government. And a government is always more than the leader. And the leader is only ever the sum of those he or she serves with. And so I'd just like to remind this chamber why, together, the executive and all Liberal parliamentarians have been such a good government. We've cut taxes for 3.3 million small to medium enterprises or call, or and we've delivered tax relief for all working Australians. We've cracked down on multinational tax avoidance. We've delivered record job growth. We've lived <laughs> over one million Australians now have jobs, over 400,000 last year alone. We're getting Australians off welfare and at the lowest level for well over, I think, two decades of working age Australians on welfare. We're returning the budget to surplus a year faster than we said that we would do initially. We've delivered the biggest reforms to childcare in this nation's history, which are now benefiting one million Australian families. We've delivered new export trade deals, which is now coming to fruition. We've got more people than ever around this country exporting, which is creating jobs right across this country. We've listed or amended 1,700 medicines on the PBS. We've guaranteed Medicare with record funding and record GP bulk billing rates of 86.1 per cent. And something that I'm particularly proud of is that we have completely in the process of revitalising our defence forces and the defence industries with a $90 billion investment in our shipbuilding program alone. And personally, I think probably the thing I'm most proud of is that we've secured our borders again and no longer are people dying at sea. And we have uh, closed over 17 detention centres and we are holding secure our borders. We've delivered important workplace reforms to stop the, current, uh, the corrupting payments between big businesses and unions. We are fully funding the NDIS and we are doing so many more things for this country. So what I would say to everybody in this place today and anybody who may be listening is that I do not recognise my party at the moment. I do not recognise the values. I do not recognise the bullying and the intimidation that has gone on. And I hope, I hope that whatever happens tomorrow after midday, that we can find a way to get back together again because it is not just the leader, the Prime Minister, it is all of us in our team who has been such a successful government. We have delivered for this country and up until now we have been a united, uh, united and a very effective party. So I would just conclude, uh, Madam, well, Mr Acting Deputy President, that whatever happens tomorrow, this is a sad day for my party and for our nation. And I just hope that, as I said, whatever happens tomorrow, um, that the behaviours that we have seen and the bullying and the intimidation that I do not recognise as liberal in any shape or way or form is brought to account. And we can find a better way, all of us in this chamber, to deal with each other and most importantly to represent the people of Australia because that is what we are here to do. We are not here to squabble with each other. We are here to serve the people of Australia. And I feel ashamed that we are letting our nation down. Thank you. Hear, hear. Senator Still. Yes, Senator Minister. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Hello. Yeah, thank you. There is a part of me that has to I have to be real clear here. It is a wonderful opportunity to attack this dysfunctional and embarrassing government that we have, but I'm not going to. And I'll tell you what I'm not going to, Mr Acting Deputy President. There are a few things I want to say that I want the people of Australia really hear and understand. There will be some very good people on that side of the chamber that I have close relationships, would never agree with them anything on, on, or most things on politics, that are hurting and hurting badly. As for the other side, and I know, I've read this book, I've seen this movie, I live this. 
This is a shocking time. And the worst part about this, with the greatest respect, that side will not recover from this. There is so much hatred and backstabbing and sniping going on. But I want to just spend one minute, I really don't want to waste this oxygen, but unfortunately I have to, on that appalling contribution from Senator Hanson. While our farmers are out there doing it darn tough, and I know, I do know, because for 13 years I have been on the Rural Regional Affairs and Transport Committee. For over 10 years I have chaired the Rural Regional Affairs and Transport Committee, and I have worked with some of the best that that side of the parliament can put up, and some of the best on this side. My old mate from Tassie. Oh, I'm, I'm saying it as it is. Fair dinkum. Richard, you are fair dinkum about farming people, as has former Senators Heffernan, Senators Williams and Senators O'Sullivan from that side. And when I hear Senator Hanson have the opportunity, how can she slap the Labor Party and bring farmers into it in her two years in this chamber? She has never once attended one single hearing with the Rural Regional Affairs and Transport Committee. She has never come to any of our meetings, our regular meetings on the 8 a.m. Wednesday morning through references and legislation to contribute anything worthwhile how she could help our farmers, whether they're battling through drought, through poor pricing, through biosecurity issues. What a disgraceful episode from that senator, and I don't even wish to even mention her name in the time I've got left. In fact, for the rest of the time I'm here in the Senate, hopefully. But let's go back to where we are at this stage. And the saddest part here, I hate to say this, there is not unity. A government was elected, a government was thrown out my government, and in came another government. And I'd said to a few of my Nat and Liberal mates up in, and I don't, I will not mention who they are, up in Roma one day back in January 2015, I said, my goodness me, the sniping has started on your Prime Minister. I said, didn't you see what it did to the Labor Party when we went through that shocking period? And there are people out there, marginal seat holders, and I'd like to see the marginal seat holders lose their position to Labor people through, a, through an election. I make no mistake about that. That's what, that's what we do. But we see when hard-working backbenchers who put their life on hold for three years are treated the way they're treated by those uh, ex, usually ex-ministers, don't have to mention Mr Abbott's name and others, normally they're in safe seats or normally they're holding number one on a Senate ticket and still have another four years to go, that spend the two or three years undermining their mates. So I had a different tack there, Mr Acting Deputy President, that I say it from the heart. The best thing we can do, the best thing that can come out of this, unfortunately for the, some of the real good people on the other side, that the Australian people do not deserve this. This is so embarrassing. So embarrassing. And it's humbling to hear Senator Reynolds' contribution, because Senator Reynolds, I know how you feel, and I know how a lot of your mates feel. The best thing that can be done now, Mr Acting Deputy President, is whoever leads the dysfunctional coalition government in the next 24 hours or so, the most humane thing they can do, the most decent thing they can do, because it will not be resolved, this will not be patched. There are friendships now that will be destroyed for life. There is no going back. And we've seen it and we've heard it, and it's personal. The best thing that can be done is the leader, the, the incoming Prime Minister, who will not have full support of the party room. There will be a lot of speeches because those poor buggers over there will have to make those speeches to try and get the unity back. But they are going to have to do the decent thing, get in the Comca, head to Yarralumla, approach the Governor-General and call for an election and let the Australian people decide. This has been 10 years. I didn't think it could get worse after 2010. My God, it has. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, and difficult to follow two speeches such as we've just heard in the chamber around the circumstance that we're in. Um, and it's, probably, it's pretty clear to anyone that this is not the finest hour of the government. It is a very difficult time, and I know Senator Steele feels that from the heart because he lived that for six years between 2007 and 2013. Uh, and it is difficult, but it has to be resolved. 
but it's but but just racing off to an election, Mr. Acting Deputy President, isn't the solution to where we sit today. Uh, getting over what's occurred this week is going to take some effort. It's going to take a lot of hard work and a lot of goodwill by members on our side. Uh, and if you look at the way that the Labor Party is operating at the moment. They've obviously had to deal with some significant internal issues post-2013, uh, uh, and we're going to have to do the same, Mr Acting Deputy President. But in the context of what the Australian people have been telling me this week is that they want—and I've said this a number of times publicly—they just want us to focus on them. Mm -hmm. We have to get past this. We have to deal with the issues that we're dealing with at the moment. But they clearly want us to focus on them. And quite frankly, Mr Acting Deputy President, I don't believe they want another election. Uh, not certainly in my patch, because we just had one. Uh, uh, and the Labor Party uh, and the Coalition went head to head, and we fought a nil all draw effectively. I think there were about 88 votes that moved in that, after that long 11 week campaign. And I don't think the Australian people do want another election. They want us to get back to focusing on them and governing for them. And I'm proud to say that this government, uh, despite what we've seen this week, has a very good record in that, in that space. It really does. We have achieved things that governments for two decades haven't been able to achieve. Uh, and some of the ministers uh, in this chamber, for example, the, the media reform that was passed by this parliament has eluded governments of all persuasions for 20 years. It's a, it's a credit to, to uh, Senator Fifield that he was able to negotiate with the industry something that they could all support and then they, that then could be passed through this parliament. So this is a government of achievement. And we were told that we wouldn't be able to do those things. We were told that the crossbenches would be too difficult to deal with, that we wouldn't be able to get uh, our legislative instruments through this parliament. But we have. We've legislated for tax cuts for individuals, uh, and, 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 and we are proud of that. We've legislated for tax cuts for small business. We have also legislated for tax cuts for businesses with a turnover of up to $50 million. Mm -hmm. And we know that if the other side are successful at the next election, that they will put their taxes back up. We've legislated for tax to come down to 25 per cent for businesses with a turnover up to $50 million. The Labor Party policy is to put that uh, to 25 per cent. The Labor Party's policy, even though it's masked in tricky language, is to put that tax rate back up to 27.5 per cent. So Australians know, Australian business knows that under the Labor Party they will pay more tax. And I can tell you the nans and pops in my neck of the woods know that they can lose up to 30 per cent of their income, their total income, through the Labor Party's nan and pop tax proposal. Uh, they're going to use that money to pay for tax cuts for everyone else. But I don't know anybody who wants their nan and pop to lose 30 per cent, up to 30 per cent of their income so that they can get a tax cut. And they're going to raise billions of dollars through this measure. They don't understand that somebody will lose up to 30 per cent of their income uh, just so that some, someone else can get a tax cut. I mean, it's an outrageous policy. So even on our worst day, and let's be fair, this hasn't been a cracker for us, even on our worst day, I think we're better than the other side. And so we will work our way through this uh, and we will provide the opportunity for the Australian people to vote for us at the next election. Senator Chisholm. Well, we just saw a bit of a Monty Python skip from those opposite uh, with that performance. Uh, the reality of what we've seen today uh, in question time here and also what we saw with question time cancelled in the other place uh, is this government is illegitimate. That's what was proved in question time today, and that's why they cancelled question time in the House of Representatives, because they know the Australian people know the gig up. They know that the gig is up with this government, because we saw it in question time how illegitimate they are, 
and we've seen it through the course of their actions this week uh, in their undermining of uh, the elected Prime Minister uh, and the way that is going to end tomorrow. And the reality is that the Liberal Party have proved themselves incapable of being a party of government. Because no matter the personality issues, the policy issues, they are divided on every single one of them. So every significant policy issue that is of concern to the Australian people, the Liberal Party are divided. There is no leader within the Liberal Party that is actually capable of uniting their team and actually coming up with policy solutions for the Australian people. And one of the first things that was drummed into me uh, when I first got involved in politics was, if you can't govern yourselves, you can't govern your country. And that is the Liberal Party this week. They can't govern themselves, they can't govern the country. Uh, every policy issue, they are divided, and no matter who becomes the leader after 12 noon tomorrow, they are hopelessly divided, be it personality, be it policy. This is the Liberal Party in 2018. Uh, and what we saw from the slapstick performance from the Leader of the Government in the Senate today was he could not tell the parliament which ministers had resigned. This is extraordinary. The Leader of the Government in the Senate could not tell the parliament which ministers had resigned. So when we look at that, these are the ministers that have resigned. These are the portfolios that have resigned. Finance, health, trade, jobs communications, human services, law enforcement, multicultural affairs, and we have an acting Home Affairs Minister. So not insignificant portfolios, and the Leader of the Government in the Senate stood in this chamber today and could not tell us whether there was an actual minister for those portfolios. That's actually what he said. He came in and said we've got represents, people representing them as senators, but do we have an actual, an actual minister for those portfolios? So they lost all pretense of being a government that actually represents the Australian people. They have been completely consumed by their internal differences, uh, by the personality clashes uh, and their policy differences. They have given up any pretense that they are actually governing for the Australian people. Uh, and what we look at when it comes to policy dysfunction, and that's been on display uh, through the course of the last couple of weeks, uh, we know what happened with the National Energy Guarantee. Uh, for 12 months they were working on a policy. Uh, they were working on a policy that was just solely focused, a policy, an energy policy, not for the Australian people, uh, not for Australian workers, not for Australian businesses. They focused on an energy policy to get it through their backbench. And they still couldn't achieve that after working on it for 12 months. Uh, and we also saw uh, that they finally got defeated uh, when it came to uh, the corporate tax, so the, the money they were going to hand out to big banks and big business, uh, they finally lost. So we end this week with basically without a Prime Minister. Uh, we know there will be a contest within the Liberal Party, but we also end it as a country with no direction from this government. Uh, they don't actually have an energy policy at the moment. They can't tell us what it is. They actually don't have an economic plan. They, don't tell, they can't tell us what it is. So you think about those Australian people that are out there and observing this today uh, and that this is the government that is supposed to be representing their interests. So for those people who are paying, can't afford to pay higher power bills because of the inaction of this government, they've had five years to do something about it, the government have abandoned them. For those people who are out there uh, looking for work and looking for a job, the government have abandoned them. Uh, for those people who live in regional areas and are concerned about school funding and the future of their uh, kids in school, the government have abandoned them. So on any significant policy area that matters to the Australian people, this government today have abandoned them. Uh, and the only solution uh, that is available to them, no matter who wins tomorrow, no matter who we end up with as leader, and you know, as each hour goes past there's more and more people that are putting their name forward, uh, is to go and call an election. That is the only way this can be solved. The Liberal Party of Australia have this week proven themselves incapable of governing. They can't govern themselves. They absolutely can't govern the country. So the question is that the motion moved by Senator McCarthy be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it.